meanest mother. We had the meanest mother in the whole world. While other kids ate candy for breakfast, we had to eat cereal, eggs, and toast. When others had Pepsi and a Twinkie for lunch, we had to eat sandwiches. And you can guess our mother fixed us a dinner that was different from other kids that they had. Mother insisted on knowing where we were at all times. You'd think we were convicts in a prison. She had to know who our friends were, what we were doing with them. She insisted that if we said we'd be gone for an hour, we would be gone for an hour or less. We were ashamed to admit it, but she had the nerve to break the child labor laws by making us work. <laughs> we had to wash dishes, make the beds, learn to cook, vacuum the floor, do laundry, and all sorts of cruel jobs. I think she would lie awake at night thinking of more things for us to do. <laughs> she always insisted on us telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. By the time we were teenagers, she could read our minds. <laughs> then, life was really tough. Mother wouldn't let our friends just honk the horn when they drove up. They had to come up to the door so she could meet them. While everyone else could date when they were 12 or 13, we had to wait till we were 16. Because of our mother, we missed out on a lot of things other kids experienced. None of us was ever caught shoplifting, vandalizing others' property, or ever arrested for any crime. It was all her fault. <laughs> the meanest mother. I can relate. Probably can too. My mom always asked me those questions. And when I misbehaved, she said, who are you hanging with? And I just look at her like, why? She said, because that attitude isn't going to fly with me. And so if you keep it up, you're not going to be hanging with them. And so she made sure that I was on track. Our mothers, they're great, aren't they? God bless them. Don't be so hard on yourself. Mothers are important to us. This morning, uh, my wife, she made sure that I wasn't going to preach on Proverbs 31, the virtuous wife. <laughs> she said, I've heard that sermon enough, and I don't need to hear it one more time. <laughs> I found out as I was studying that this is the hardest sermon for pastors to preach. Did you know that? It was Mother's Day. Because they love their moms, and they don't want to offend, they don't want to hurt them, they don't want to condemn them, they don't want to do anything that's going to make them feel less. And so I hope this morning that anything I say, you don't feel any less. I hope you're encouraged, hope you're strengthened, that you know God loves you just the way you are. God bless you. Colossians 3, 12 through 15. That's our scripture verse this morning, and I'd like to read that to you first. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. I just thank you for this time that we're having this morning. I ask, Lord, that you just bless each and every one that's here, especially our mothers. We so love them, and we know that you so love them also. I'm just thankful, Lord, for this time together. ask that you just bless. Give me the right words to speak, and I just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. When I graduated from Bible college in the 70s, 
the college that I was at, they announced at the end that they were going to go on a round-the-world tour. And they said, and if you're interested in going on this tour around the world, um, come to this meeting that they were going to have in the auditorium. And so I went home, and I told Barb about it, and she said, well, why don't you go? And I said, okay. And so I went to the meeting, and there was hundreds, hundreds of students there. And so they went on to explain about what they were going to do. They were going to go around the world, and they were going to minister and do different things at bi other Bible colleges and churches, and um, it sounded like an exciting trip. They got to the end, and they said, this is going to cost about $2,500. I know in today's money that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but this is back when minimum wage was like a buck fifty. Gas was like thirty some cents. So twenty five hundred dollars was a lot of money back then. And I didn't have twenty five hundred dollars. So I thought, well, forget that. And I went home and told Barb about it and she says, well, that sounds neat. And I said, yeah, but $2,500? And she says, well, God can do something. And I said, well, that's a lot of money. And we didn't have $500 laying around, let alone $2,500 laying around. She said, well, go to the next, next meeting. So they'd called another meeting so that you could go home and talk to this with your family and stuff. And so the next meeting, I went back to it, and there was only 50 people. The hundreds had vanished, because they'd found out this wasn't a free trip. I guess we're all kind of stupid, and we all thought we were going for free. And so we found out it wasn't free, and so it cut down the numbers real fast. And so anyway, I went to the next meeting, and they explained a little bit more about what we were going to do, and, and uh, encouraged us that if we were still interested that we needed to kind of let others know, if you don't have the money, let others know and see if they would help you out, like family and friends. So I went home and told Barb again, well, here's what they're suggesting. And I said, I don't want to do that. I said, we, we don't know people that have that kind of money just laying around. Like I said, this was a lot of money. And she says, well, go ahead with it and do what, do what you got to do. So they gave us a form letter, and we filled it out, and we sent it off to all of our friends and family, and, and the money started coming in. And so it was, a, it was a neat thing, because I realized how much people cared about me, and they believed in me. And so I was able to go on a round-the-world tour, and it changed my life forever. It was an exciting um, time where God really spoke to my heart, and really shared some things with me personally for the rest of my life. And so it was a thing that I believe that was very important for me to go on this thing. This morning, I believe that we can help people become all God's created them to be. Most people won't fulfill their full potential without somebody in their life encouraging them and believing in them. I believe as husbands, children, whatever, we have the opportunity to encourage, to build up, to challenge those around us. And they should be better off because of us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know the love chapter. It says in verse 7, it says, love never gives up, never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. What I get out of that verse is that love is intentional. If we're not intentional with the things that we do, I believe we miss many opportunities. If we look back over our life, most likely we will see somebody that played a pivotal role in our lives to get us where we are today. Maybe it was a boss, a school teacher, a parent, a grandparent, a coach, someone. If it's none of those, maybe it was just Jesus. 
And I believe somebody believed in us. And it's our turn to believe in others. There's no greater investment in life than being a people builder. We need to be that. Relationships are more important than accomplishments. In Colossians 3.19, it says for husbands to love their wives. And in Ephesians, it says just as Christ loved the church. God is counting on us to bring out the best in others. I've heard it said that you can tell by a woman's countenance how her husband treats her. I want to know, how am I doing in that area? Years ago, we had neighbors, and there were two retired gentlemen. And one, he would come over, and he, I think I was their entertainment, by the way. <laughs> they, they had nothing to do. And they would come over, and they'd say, what are you doing, Gary? And I'd tell them what I was doing. And the one, he always help, was helpful. He said, I've got a tool that makes that even easier for you. <laughs> and he'd go off home, and he'd come back with his tool, and he'd show me how to use it and what I needed to do, and this will make it a lot easier for you, Gary. My other neighbor, he would come, and he'd say, what are you doing, Gary? And I'd tell him, he goes, wow, I've never seen it done like that before. <laughs> and I'd just look at him. He never had a positive word the whole time I lived there. He always had something to say, and so when he came, I, I wanted to hide. The other one, I enjoyed his company. I enjoyed him coming around, sharing his wealth of knowledge with me. And so I believe in our lives, we need to make sure that we are sowing seeds of encouragement, compliment, I believe the Bible says that we're going to reap what we sow. And so if we're sowing those kind of things, we're going to be reaping those kind of things in our lives. If they're struggling with something, you will know. Step in. Be an encouragement. When you believe the best in them, you help bring the best out of them. When someone believes in you, it helped, didn't it? I remember we, when I was in college, I was in a very holy business, getting ready for getting in the ministry, I guess. I was made donuts. And so I worked for Winchell's Donuts for four years. Yeah, you were wondering where I was going with that, right? <laughs> holy business. Um, and so I'd made donuts and in, as I was going to college, and we came to Spokane, and we... Uh, wanted to start another donut shop. And I had those in my life that came alongside and said, how can I help? And they were a blessing to me. And I appreciate them. And those people are the ones, again, that change your life forever. The donut shop didn't change my life forever. But it was just people believing in me, giving me a chance. Sometimes, yeah, it doesn't work the best, but sometimes you just need somebody to believe in you. You'll be amazed how they respond when they know you care. And this is what Jesus did. He didn't focus on weaknesses. He focused on us and what we could become. If you think about his disciples, he didn't go to the local synagogue and look for the most righteous, spiritual people he just grabbed people off the street and he knew what they could become and he put his heart and soul into them they didn't have to be perfect we don't bring out the best in others by condemning or criticizing them but by believing and caring about them criticism acts as a depressant when we criticize, it doesn't help. Compliment is a stimulant. I believe we need to stimulate those around us so that we're encouraging them to be all that they can be. Don't focus on the weaknesses, but on their strengths. We need to magnify what is right. 
If we treat others the way we want them to be, they are much more likely to become that. Be their greatest cheerleader. I say that because Barb's always been mine. She's been there through the stupid ideas that I have, the dumb ideas I have, the donut shop ideas that I had. Whatever it is, Barb's always been my biggest cheerleader. I believe that we need to be cheerleaders in others' lives. Because as we are, as we explain to our couples, there's a love bank. We have deposits and we have withdrawals. Make sure you're depositing good things, positive things, compliments, encouragement to those that are around us. Because there's also withdrawals. They're going to happen. Yes, we're going to have to withdraw. Just like in our bank accounts, we withdraw. But if we just are always withdrawing, what happens? It doesn't work, does it? At the end of the week, we don't have enough to pay our bills. Well, the same way in our relationship bank accounts. We have to have lots of deposits. And as we do, those deposits are going to turn into good things in our lives. We can think good thoughts all day long about someone, but it doesn't do them any good if we don't verbalize it. I'm probably first in line for that one. I think a lot of good things. And to me, it's not so easy to verbalize it sometimes. But I encourage you, make sure you're verbalizing. Make sure you're letting them know. I had a person from church here this last week call me and encourage me. He just didn't say, ah, Gary doesn't need that. I appreciated that. And it was a blessing to me. So don't let the enemy tell you otherwise and say, ah, don't waste your time. Good thoughts are good enough. No, they're not. So make sure you're verbalizing these things. It's easier to find fault. Make up your mind not to do that. When we were younger, we used to buy homes, and we'd remodel them. They were fixer-uppers. They were pretty dumpy. And our kids were pretty, pretty young at the time, and I'd give them each a hammer. And I'd say, tear this wall down. And they just you could just see their eyes light up. Really? And they'd just start a-pounding and a-ripping and a-destroying. And they just would have a blast. Now, when it came to the building time, that's not when I needed them. <laughs> because they didn't know what to do. But to tear down, my illustration, anybody can tear down. Anybody can tear down. It doesn't take any thought. It doesn't take any work. It doesn't take any knowledge to tear down. Those kids did not know one thing about drywall, the two-by-fours, or any of the nails, or any of that stuff. All they knew is to be careful with that hammer, don't hit your brother or your sister, <laughs> and start ripping. And so that I could do other things. And so we need to make sure that we're not tearing down. We're going to be known for something. Let's be known for building up. Amen? The only thing that will really last is the investment that we make in others. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron. So a friend sharpens a friend. And I believe that we do that. It isn't by criticism. It's by being encouraging. It's helping. It's inspiring. It's helping them to be a better individual. Are the people in our lives better off because we're in it? I hope you can say yes. I've come to know and understand after 46 years of marriage that Barb isn't half as interested in what I can provide for her as she is in how I make her feel. She told me for years, do you love me? And I'd look at her like, why would you ask me such a question? <laughs> what do you mean, do I love you? But she wasn't feeling it. I was just sitting on my butt when I came home from work because I'd worked so hard. I deserved to sit down. 
kick up my feet and watch TV while she did everything. And I realized real fast that that wasn't really letting her know how much I cared about her. And I found out that, you know, it wasn't that hard to do something for her, to help, to give a helping hand. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, you want to know how he, what he did? Every morning, he rose up and blessed his wife. He said, there are many beautiful women in the world, but you excel them all. Isn't that nice? He started out his day complimenting his wife. Your wife is a gift and a treasure. I believe we need to give her that reward. They need our approval. Solomon wrote the book Song of Solomon, and in the book he praised his wife over 40 times. This isn't praise because she deserved it or earned it. He saw the results of doing it, and she automatically rose higher. And because Solomon praised his children, the children rose up and blessed her as well. I believe we husbands and fathers, we're setting the examples for our homes. How we treat our wife will have a great impact on how our children respect and honor their mother. So in closing, how do we apply all of this? Number one, I believe we need to compliment every day. Compliment about the meals, the kids, how she looks, how the house looks. We need to encourage and build them up and look for opportunities. We need to apply this. If we're not doing that, we're missing out on a lot of things that we need to say to our wife. Engage in meaningful conversation. This, again, was a tough one for me. I wasn't a real talker. Like I said, I'd come home, sit down, kick my feet up, turn the TV on. How was your day? Good. How was this? Fine. How was that? Okay. I'd give her one-word answers, and she'd just look at me like, okay, this isn't working. <laughs> she was smart, and so she made me say sentences. <laughs> she would draw them out of me. So she'd give me questions that weren't yes and no answers. And so I had to learn that I had to start talking, and she let me know how important that was to her that she wanted to be involved in my day and what had happened and what transpired. I'd go to a meeting and she'd say, who was at the meeting? And I'm just like, what, you want their, every single person's name? Well, well, yeah, kind of. And I'm just like, are you serious? <laughs> and so I would learn that on my way home from meetings, from work, I would be intentional and I would start thinking about the things that I needed to say to her because she wanted to be involved in my life. And so I, rather than just saying, not a big deal. Don't worry about who was there. <laughs> it doesn't matter. No, it did matter to her. And if it matters to her, then it should matter to me. And so as I would think about those things, I had to be intentional because that wasn't how my brain worked. I was done with the meeting. I wanted to forget about the meeting or work or whatever. I'm going on home. Let's, let's forget about all of that. And so I had to be intentional. And number three, we need to participate. What can I do to lighten your load? Again, I would sit there and do nothing. I just figured... It was her job to take care of the house, do the vacuuming, wash the dishes, whatever it was that needed to be done. It was her job. I'd done my job. And I found out real quick that I needed to participate. I wanted to ask her, how can I help? What can I do to make your load easier? And I encourage you also that maybe you find out the least favorite chore that she does and say, how can I help? How can I help do that? You know, I found at first I, I rebelled against all this. I'm just like, no. But when I realized how important she was to me, that doing those things wasn't that big of a deal. It didn't add up 
to hours of time that I had to spend just to make her happy. It just took minutes, usually. Oftentimes, she'd say, will you take out the garbage? And I'd say, yes. Guess what? The next day, she said, the garbage didn't get taken out. I go, ah, oh, sorry. So I learned that when she said, take the garbage out, TV, whatever we were doing was not more important. I'd get up and I'd take it out so that she didn't have to keep asking me and that I'm making her be an egg. I don't want to make my wife an egg. I want her to be happy with me. When we make someone else's day, I believe God will make ours. I've been blessed in my life with many people that believed in me. But far greater is the question, who am I believing in and who am I being a cheerleader to? I believe it's so important that we're cheering someone on, that we're being intentional, thinking about it. I look out in this crowd and I see so many of you that are intentional. You're already doing it right. But there's slow, slow bloomers like me that need this. But we look for opportunities also. Look for opportunities. What can I do? Not opportunities to not, but opportunities to help. We're never more like God than when we give. The closest thing to God's heart is helping others. Be generous with your positive words. Honor your wife and your mom today, and we're so thankful for you. Yeah, give Gary a big hand there. <laughs> Gary took the husband and wife approach, and I so appreciate Barb and Gary at, at Northbridge. Amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, I just want to take just 30 seconds, probably more than 30 seconds, but 30 seconds of um, uh, from talking from the kid perspective, because all of us are a kid. We all have a mom, and many of your moms are still here. And I want to just encourage you for a moment that your moms are doing great, but they sometimes don't feel like it. And I don't know where your relationship is with your mom, but I want to encourage you to make sure today she knows that you love her and you're thankful for her and that maybe she was a, like Gary's story at the beginning, a mean mom. I, I had a mean mom. I still have. She's still alive. But I had, I, I had a mean mom. When we were kids growing up, <clears throat> she would go and stand in front of a door and stop and just wait for me to open it. And it taught me to open doors for ladies. It taught me. Now, at the time, I was like, ah, oh, geez, I'm 30 feet away. Can you just open the door, Mom? Like, come on. But it taught me to always be kind. And my sisters, I have two sisters, they did the same thing, taught me to be respectful. And now I get to teach my son to be respectful. Sometimes mean moms are the best moms, as Gary was talking about. And there's a great scripture Paul says in, in the book of Ephesians, a scripture my mom read to me every day it felt like. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. Not because they are perfect, but because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother. It doesn't say honor them when they're perfect. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Verse 3, if you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have long life on the earth. When you honor your parents, I don't want you to think about, okay, but they were, that's not what scripture says. That's not what Paul says. My mom doesn't know how to work a phone. My mom doesn't know how to, do, they're so frustrating. They live in the ancient times, like they, wh whatever. It does, they, they didn't live right. It doesn't matter. Paul says, honor them, and things will go well for you. We live in a society where honor isn't necessarily cool. Respect isn't necessarily cool because we, as young folks, as the younger generation of any age, we got it figured out, right? I don't know if you felt that, but I felt that as a, as a teenager and as a kid. Mom, I'm way cooler than you. I'm way smarter than you. One of these days, you'll figure it out. When, in fact, I needed to learn to honor and I did. At a young age, my dad and my mom taught me how to honor and obey my parents, and things have gone well for me in my life. Not perfect, and I was not perfect by far. 
but we can honor our parents despite how they act. There's a great story in the Old Testament of Noah. And he, after the flood and after they come and the earth goes back to normal, he has a vineyard and he messes up and he gets drunk. And one of his sons go in there and he goes and tells his other brothers, hey, look, dad got drunk. Let's go look at him. And the other brothers walk in backwards, not to embarrass dad. They walk in backwards and cover him up and say, we're going to honor dad. In spite of his mistakes, because we all are human. In spite of who they are, I'm going to be an honorable kid. Today, I want to encourage you to honor your moms no matter what. And I, I know relationships are volatile and there's a lot going on there. But at some point, you can do whatever you can to honor your mom. If a text is hard, if a phone call is hard, do something today to show honor. And not just to your moms, but the generation before you. The Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. And the generation before you, no matter what age you are, deserve some honor and some respect. And can we do that today? I want to pray with you. God, I...